Oh, welcome back to JLF Suneva Fushi. And for those of you who haven't had the opportunity of reading A Rude Life by V. Sangvi, uh, my suggestion is go out and pick it up because it really gives you the span of media and the publishing world for over five decades, given that V started writing his first columns when he was roughly around 18 years or less uh, in between uh, school and university. We, you know, one of the things that comes through in this book is how kind you have been to politicians. Was it that they were nicer people in those days, or uh, what has changed? Because in many ways, you have this really lovely sense of even people like, whether it's Sharad Pawar or VP Singh or the then chief minister in Maharashtra, you've treated them with great kindness. You think so? I mean, I've been criticized for the things I've said about VP Singh, who I've called unscrupulous. I've said about Sharad Pawar that you had the sense that he would do whatever was necessary to get ahead. So I don't know if I've been that kind, but yes, it is true that instead of just writing the kind of invective we normally hurl at politicians, I've tried as much as possible to humanize them. And if you humanize people, there's a danger you make them slightly likable. They are. And in the same way that you talk about access to these politicians, you yeah. were a young journalist in Bombay trying to get access to the chief minister, etc. What has changed between then and now? Is it as easy? <clears throat> has it become more difficult? Is it's access the sense of power? I think the media world was much smaller then. So it was easier to get access. Now there's a multiplicity of media. In those days, it was just print. Now there's television, there's new media. And whether it's politicians or whether it's movie stars, there are machines now at work. You have to go through PRs, you have to go through range various kinds of people who will ask you what your questions are, ask you to submit them in advance. It was a much naiver era. People would just, you could call up, you could walk up to people and they would talk to you. Now, if you want an interview with not just a politician, say a movie star, you won't get one. You'd have to go to the PR. The PR would say, wait till she or he has a film releasing. Then we have slotted 20 interviews. We will give you 10 minutes where he or she will talk about the film. What are the questions you're going to ask? And if you ask a question that's not on the script, they'll interrupt the interview and stop you from doing it. It's the same thing with politicians. Most politicians now will ask you to submit your questions in advance. In the case of many people, you will be then given answers which have already been written, written by somebody else, of course, to your questions. And then you'll be taken in to have a chat with the politician, to take photographs to indicate that you've met him. But he will not answer any questions at all. Some politicians, perhaps the top politicians of the country, either don't give interviews or just take your questionnaire and some minion writes answers and they pack you off, and then you can say, I had an exclusive interview with the Prime Minister or whoever. In fact, one of the uh, Tell Me All interviews was your interview with Rajiv Gandhi on yeah. the flight when yeah. he talked about Zeni, uh, uh, Gyani Zen, uh, Zel Singh. Will you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, it was to be fair to Rajiv, not an interview. It was an off-the-record conversation. I was a young journalist. I was 30. I had just become editor of Sunday magazine. I'd never met a prime minister in my life. They took me on the prime minister's plane. I don't know if it's changed. Probably got even more intimidating. But it was really intimidating. You didn't go to the normal airport. You went to the official airport, which was run by the Air Force. You were then taken on board the special aircraft. You entered from the back. And it had completely different seating. You had at least, if you were near the front, you had like railway seating, sides, uh, seats on both sides. and tables in the middle. You waited for the prime minister to come, and then his car drove up to the staircase. And all of us watched, our sort of noses pressed against the glass. He got into, he climbed up the staircase, got into his cabin. They shut the door. And within, I think, five seconds, the plane was moving. So it was like no other flight I'd ever taken. He had his own cabin with a bedroom, a living room, etc. And then, if you were lucky, they took you in to meet him. It's, I don't know, Mr. Modi doesn't take journalists on his plane, but I've heard that his predecessors, Manmohan Singh, for instance, if he took you in, he'd give you five minutes of, hello, how are you? Here's a picture, go away. 
Whereas Rajiv Gandhi in that era was very different because Rajiv Gandhi liked engaging with people. He liked engaging particularly, oddly enough, with people who challenged him, who didn't agree with him. And I had just done before that, before I met him, an article on Gyani Zell Singh, who was president of India, who had accused Rajiv Gandhi of treating him very badly. And apparently Rajiv had seen the article. So I went into this cabin and he knew what I was gonna talk about, but I think it says something about the guy that he realized that I was incredibly nervous and so, and that we had limited time. But he said, screw the time. And he just chatted to me. He took pictures of the Himalayas. We were flying off to the Northeast. And he talked about cameras. He said, I thought incredibly indiscreet things. He was taking photographs with an icon camera. And I said, in those days, most people didn't have photographic prints. They used to get what were called transparencies. And he said, it's very hard to get pictures developed in India. I send everything to Italy, and they do it all for me in Italy, which is the kind of thing if he said it now, it would be headlines everywhere. But he said it was good humor. He told a joke. He said he was very proud of this camera, but you know, Nikon has a new model, and it's not very good. I was in Japan, and I met the prime minister, who I think was Nakasone then. And he said to me, I hear you're interested in cameras. So I said, yes, I am. And he said, you know, Nikon has a new model. So I said, yes, I know that, Prime Minister. But it is crap. Let me tell you what is wrong with the new model. And he proceeded to destroy the new model while this Japanese Prime Minister's face grew smaller and smaller. And they said, very sad goodbye. He was mystified. He got onto the plane. And they showed him the gift that the government of Japan had given him. It was the Nikon camera. He just spent all his time rubbishing. Now, he had no reason to tell me this story. But he told it, I think, to put me at ease. So by the time I started, started talking about Zell Singh, I was much more confident than I would have been otherwise. And he let slip. I mean, he just told me his side of the story, incredibly terrible things about Zell Singh and what Zell Singh had done, what an embarrassment he was, etc. And finally, I think we talked for a long, long time. We were nearing to land. Manishankar Ayer, who was his press advisor, came in and said, sir, we have to land. Led me back to my seat, went into the cabin, and came back and said, what did he tell you? So I said, well, he told me about Zell Singh and what Zell Singh had done and how Zell Singh was an international embarrassment when he traveled, etc." He said, oh my God. So he went back into the cabin and according to money, I wasn't there for this. He said to Rajiv, he said, sir, you realize you've told a journalist really bad things about the president of India? And Rajiv said, really? But I didn't talk about his womanizing and screwing around. <laughs> <laughs> but but apparently, that's how it happened. I went back and, of course, because it was a fair story, I went and spoke to Zell Singh and we did a story quoting both sides. And on the whole, I think Zell Singh actually came off better in that version. But Rajiv didn't hold that against me, though money did. But he was just, in that sense, willing to engage with people, to talk to you, to joke, to laugh. There have been prime ministers who've done that afterwards, but very few, unfortunately. And that was one of the stories that really uh, set a Sunday magazine back on track yes, and made it, again, a very esteemed uh, magazine to write for. Tell us about how you decided to join Sunday magazine and how you picked up the phone on uh, Avigda okay. and... Uh, sure. I used to work, I worked first for Bombay magazine, which was owned by Arun Puri, who is here. And after Bombay, I went abroad for a year on an Inlax fellowship. The Inlax Foundation is run by Sonu Shivdasani's family. So how's that for incestuous connections? I then came back to India and I became editor of a magazine called Imprint. And it was successful and it did reasonably well. But I was then stuck with the idea that if I hung on in Bombay, we're talking about 85, 86, I would spend my life being a Bombay journalist that I interview Amitabh Bachchan a few times, maybe the chief minister a few times, but I'd gone as far as I could go. So I decided I want a national job. I was friends then with Samir Jain, who was just taking over the Times of India, who offered me a really good job. And it was clear to me, he was very, very sharp. I mean, he had a slightly different view of journalism from me in that I saw it as a noble calling, he saw it as the stuff between the ads. But there's no doubt that he was offering me a very good job. And something, a small voice inside me said, I don't want to work for the Times of India. Another voice said, I don't want to be a Bombay journalist all my life. So I, 
I had heard good things about Anand Bazar Patrika, which in those days owned Sunday, the Telegraph, it still does own Telegraph, and was a major newspaper force. I had heard there was this editor called Avik Sarkar, who was the owner. So I called him and I said, I want to meet you. And he didn't seem at all surprised. He said, yes, I will be in Bombay on such and such date. I have a house in Mafatlal Park. Come to see me. So I turned up at the appointed time. You remember, Bombay was very different from the rest of India. Bombay proprietors, journalists looked like everybody else. And I was taken into this large, expensively decorated drawing room where sprawled out on a sofa was a gentleman who had escaped from the 18th century wearing this kurta, starched dhoti, diamond buttons on his collars, etc., and very exaggerated Bengali Raj type mannerisms. So I sat down, he said, Tell me about yourself. And I said, well, I have been editing. He said, yes, I know all that. Where were you born? So I said, London. At which stage, I think he sat up a little more carefully and retreated me with more respect. And then he said, where did you go to college? You go to St. Stephen's. So I said, no, I went abroad. He said, where? So I said, I went to college in England. So he said, where? Oxford or Cambridge? And I had the sense that if I had said Birmingham, he would have asked me to leave the room or immediately. <laughs> Fortunately, I was able to say Birmingham. And I don't know if that's what swung it, but he said, come to Calcutta and I will make you, and I will make you an offer. So I went to Calcutta, which I had never been to in my life, and I stayed at the Grand Hotel. And I called him and I said, I'm Well, here. actually, first you stayed in a... In a slightly that, no, rundown hotel. That's, oh, that's, that's the second time. No, that's where I worked for him. This one, this time I was paying myself. So I stayed at the Grand Hotel and I called him and I said, can I come and see you? He said, sure. So come at three o'clock. And I said, what's the address? And he laughed as though I was an idiot. And he said, this is Anand Bazar Patrika. We are the establishment in Bengal. Everyone knows what the address is. So I got out of the hotel. I hailed a taxi, I told the guy, he'd never heard of Anand Bazar Patrika. So I called the doorman from the Oberoi, who then berated this guy and explained to him famous newspaper, etc. So good story. So I went and he, we drove up this driveway of this really impressive old Raj building. And I wandered in and I said, I'm here to meet Avik Sarkar. And they looked at me as I was crazy. Another guy took pity on me and said, sorry, he's brought you to the statesman. This is not Anand Bazar Patrika. <laughs> So I then got and got out and walked. Fortunately, it was not a large distance to one small shop where a so tailor shop opposite which was a very ugly building, which was the office of Anand Bazar Patrika. And I said to Avik, I'm sorry I was late, but this is what happened. So rather than show any trace of embarrassment, he looked at me as though I was a congenital idiot and said, as I said, acted as though nothing had happened and proceeded to offer me the editorship for Sunday. And, w and once you took over a week at some point of time as you started hiring, people said, well, if there are two Bengalis with a particular name, hire the Brahmin and make yeah, sure he's yeah, from yeah, Presidency yeah. College. It was completely appalling because he said, look at them and if other things are equal, then always hire the Brahmin. Don't hire anybody else. So, uh, you know me, all of us, it really got me agitated. And he said, when you look at colleges, hire people from Presidency, they know how to write. So that I was prepared to accept. But this hire the Brahmin, I thought was absurd. So I interviewed a few people, in fact, with him. And then I said to him, I said, Avik, I know you're a Brahmin, but, and I know you went to presidency, but I refuse to be part of this mafia. He said, first of all, I did not go to presidency. Secondly, I'm not a Brahmin, I'm a Kayast. So I said, why are you asking me to hire Brahmins? He said, because they're better educated. So the first person I then hired with the Vik Sarkar's concurrence was actually a Brahmin. Seema Goswami, you're sitting in this row over here. <laughs> in, in fact, that's where he met you. And, and, and in the interview, you thought he was somebody completely different, yeah, yeah, an avuncular him. uncle of some sort who was pretending to be the managing editor. Tell us about that. Yeah, sure. She walked and she was must have been what, just out of college and there was Avik Sarkar and I and there were lots and lots of these well-intentioned, earnest Bengalis, well-read, talking about things and discussing the world. And then walks this very aggressive, pushy Punjabi lady who sits down and regards us both with absolute contempt and then <laughs> continues to lecture us and then leaves. And so Avik said to me, you've got to hire her. So I said, why? He said, if she's like this with us, think what she'll do to politicians and other people, which was right, and we hired her. 
We discovered later that such was her research. She had gone through the whole interview and then after we hired her, for I think the first month, she thought my name was Shubhavrita Bhattacharya because that was the last editor of Sunday. This is the true story, right? <laughs> But we tell, you know, in those days, was it about, you know, a particular group of people being in charge of all of media, both owning and at the editorial? Whether no, it no, it was very different because journalists, particularly Bombay journalists, it was Behram. People, you may remember some of these people, mostly forgotten, Behram Contractor, there was Vinod Mehta. At the Times of India, there was Girilal Jain. These were all vaguely drawn from the same background. But there was even there a huge gulf between reporters and editors. At the Times of India, if you were an editor or even a leader writer, which they called an assistant editor, you got a cabin of your own. And you had nothing to do with the people who actually reported the news. The very famous story of Shamlal, who in his later years, when he thought he wouldn't get an extension, began socializing a bit. And he met one guy who was very respectful at a party and spoke to him a great deal. And Shamlal said to him, you know, young man, you seem very well informed. What do you do? He said, sir, you don't know me. I'm chief reporter of the Times of India. <laughs> so it's, it's a true story. That's the kind of gap that there was between editors and correspondents and reporters. And the gap between working journalists and proprietors was even larger. I mean, Samir Jain, as I said, saw journalism is the stuff between the ads. I went and met Ramnath Goenka, who I knew quite well, who was passed into legend as this great champion of press freedom, etc., who had complete contempt for journalists, regardless of what people will tell you now. In uh, Delhi, the Birlas, KK Birla ran the Hindustan Times, saw it as a way of advancing his power, his position. These were essentially banyas who really had no respect for journalists at all. So how did the sort of journalist tribe grow opposed this? How did they fight this particular establishment? Uh, in the way that it was an establishment? I think what happened was that the Indian middle class grew, and it happened in the 80s, though we say it happened after liberalization, but it began, it began happening in the 1980s. India was at least English-speaking, educated India, was a very small country in those days. Everybody knew somebody, or you knew somebody who knew somebody. For instance, I went to work for Bombay Magazine, where I was editor because I was writing for India Today. I was writing for India Today because my best friend from school had a mother who worked for India Today. She recommended me for editorship of Bombay Magazine. And Arun, who I then knew socially, hired me. My next job at Imprint, Arvi Pandit, was a friend of my father's. So it was actually fairly incestuous and quite a small circle, which was one reason I wanted to go to Calcutta and to break out of it. But eventually, there were just too many people in the middle class and in the upper middle class for everyone to know everyone. And has that changed now with the whole advent of digital media, people like Article 14 and the scroll and so on and so forth? Has that yes. nexus been broken? I think so. I think a lot of the people who run new media started out in old media. I think the old newspaper proprietors are a dying breed. There was a time when if you ran the Hindustan Times or the Express or the Times of India, prime ministers would quake when they saw your paper. These days, the Modi sees your paper and doesn't like the cartoon. They file an enforcement directed case against you, put you in jail. So the whole power balance has changed completely. Newspaper proprietors are no longer powerful. Nobody really cares about them. They don't make any money either because the newspaper industry is in crisis all over the world. Not completely on the verge of collapse in India as it is elsewhere, but it's only a matter of time. But haven't they also pushed towards this collapse? I mean, look at papers, the mainstream papers, Times of India, Hindustan Times, which is less news and much more. So why should people buy into that as opposed to buy into, uh, say, the digital media? Well, it's interesting because Samir Jain, who revolutionized media in India, had this idea, which was that we pay too much for newspapers. Bear in mind that India had the cheapest newspapers in the world at this stage. Admittedly, they were printed on what looked, looked like loo paper, but the journalism sometimes was okay. And Samir said, we'll make no money from readers there to purr. We'll make money only from advertisers. So he began giving newspapers away for almost nothing. 
there were price wars where you sold a rupee, a, a rupee a paper, or if you took the Times, you got the Economic Times free or the Navbharat Times free. So we have a situation now, it still persists, where newspapers make all of their money from advertising, very little from subscription, and all the circulation figures you see are jokes because they give away the papers, right? So most people who get newspapers don't necessarily value them, have never really wanted to read them. So when the advertising shifts away, when it goes to digital, when it goes to television, this whole advertising-driven model of newspapers is completely screwed. And yes, so in that sense, the newspaper barons, by trying to turn their newspapers into just vehicles for advertising, have destroyed themselves. And I, I can't say I'm sorry for them. But even in the past, there were other benefactors. I was absolutely stunned to read, for example, in imprint when you ran into somebody who said, yeah. well, that was a little CIA operation that I was funding. Yeah, yeah. This, well, again, we're talking about the early 60s. There was an American couple called Gloria and Arthur Hale who lived in Bombay and started this magazine called Imprint. And Imprint used to take big best-selling American novels. And you know, I don't know how many people remember the Reader's Digest, but the Reader's Digest used to do a condensed book in every issue, which was basically they took the sense of a book, the core of a book, and then cut it down into one, one third, one fourth its size. So they used to do three to four bestsellers in every issue. How they got the rights, I never quite worked out because imprint was quite cheap. But it was a successful publication. They were very well known. Gloria Hale edited it. Arthur Hale was, had another claim to fame. If you say you remember this, you give away your age. But there used to be something called Bullworker. I don't know how if anyone remembers it. There you are. So. Bullworker was the first successful product in India to be sold entirely by mail order. Uh, it was started entirely by Arthur Hale, who then launched the mail order industry. One of the people who worked for Imprint briefly was a man called Philip Knightley, who was an Australian, who then went on to England and became a great investigative reporter for the Sunday Times. So I knew Philip a little bit. And he told me that he just interviewed an ex, he, he used to write a lot about espionage, an ex-CIA station chief in Delhi called Harry Rosicki. And he said to Harry Rosicki, well, you know, I know India, I spent some time there. So he said, what do you do in India? He said, I was the editor of a magazine. So Harry said, what magazine? So Philip said, you probably won't have heard of it. So he said, no, what was it called? So he said, imprint. He said, ah, one of my little operations, you worked for me. And he then discovered that the CIA had planted people all across the media to run publications like this. Because contrary to what we think, the Cold War was not fought entirely at the level of government secrets. It was also a cultural war. And they believed that if they were able to get American fiction, American movies, American values into middle class minds and classrooms, they would win that cultural war. So according to what Harry Ruzitsky told Philip, this was just one example. There were many, many things all over India that were completely funded by the CIA till what? The late 60s. Or and the KGB. Or, and and the, according to Philip, there was an opposite, office opposite him, which was a KGB publication. So when Mrs. Gandhi complained, you know, the CIA have done this, I said, the woman is mad. She was not mad. It was true. The CIA and the KGB were incredibly active in the media right up to the 70s. And I imagine even now. Pretty much like what Lord Macaulay said after he toured India, saying that these people are too bright and the only way we can rule them is by uh, making sure we have their education and culture and we show them that they're the most superior one. Which, is, which is why you and I are sitting here speaking in English. I I exactly, <laughs> and which is why the present dispensation is looking at education and culture so very specifically and trying to see whether that can be used to control uh, young minds today. Yeah, but they're looking at it even more differently. It's, some of them are Hindi wallas, as you'll have seen in the uproar we've had over the last month. But they're looking at history. They want Hindus to grow up with a sense of grievance. They want to fill the history books with the horrors of Muslim kings and their rule, with stories about how Fatehpur Sikri, which was an ancient Hindu city, was taken over by the Muslims. The Taj Mahal, which is apparently a palace of the Jaipur dynasty, or so this very stupid woman who's now head of the family, claims, and was taken over by Shah Jahan and turned into a Mughal mausoleum, which of course it wasn't. They want this stuff in the history books so that every Hindu child who grows up 
feels, my God, my ancestors were wrong. Muslims were really bad people. And every Muslim child who enters that, who goes into that school and reads those books, feels, oh my God, I'm going to be an outcast here, pariah here. My ancestors did terrible things to these Hindus. That's the India they want to create. Reading your book, you look at so much that's changed and yet nothing has changed. There's pretty much in the beginning of the book, you look at the story of the, with Dilip Kumar. Yeah. And tell us about that because it's, it was so sad to read that. That was five decades ago. Yeah. With that sense that, you know, what has changed? Where have we got to? Well, it was in the 60s. Dilip Kumar was then the top actor of the day. He was well respected. He was sort of mixture of Amitabh Bachchan and Shah Rukh Khan in public esteem without any of the controversies till then that either man has been associated with. My father was a lawyer. He came to see him because he had made a film called Ganga Jamna. And the censor that asked for 22 cuts in Ganga Jamna, which meant that the film would be destroyed. And he asked my father to fight a case. And they went into negotiations with the censors. And they won every single thing. And ultimately, the film was released. It became a big hit. It was suspected, we never actually proved this, that Raj Kapoor had a film called Jis Desh Me Ganga Bhati Hai, also about a dacoit, which was coming at the same time. And as long as Ganga Jamna could be delayed for about a year, Raj Kapoor's film would be OK. So Raj Kapoor's film did OK, and Ganga Jamna was a hit when it was released. But one consequence of all this is that I grew up with Dilip Kumar in my house quite a lot, and my father knew him well. And he then approached my father and he said, I need you to act for me. I think I'm going to be arrested. So he said, why? He said, they've just raided my house. So he said, on what charge? He said, on the charge that I'm a Pakistani spy. And he said, why would they raid your house? He said, I mean, this is bizarre now. They were looking for the shortwave transmitter I use to communicate with my controllers in Pakistan. So my father said, you're nuts. So they then discovered what had happened. The Calcutta police had arrested a young man who they said had Pakistani sympathies. He was not a terrorist. There was no terrorism those, those, those days, just a traitor. And he had a list of people he had put into his book, his address book, many of, nearly all of whom were Muslims, many of whom lived in Bombay, many of whom were friends of my parents. And the Calcutta police, with the connivance of the Maharashtra police, which were then rough, who were then roughly as communal as they are today, went ahead harassing all of those people, trying to arrest them. And we thought that this would certainly not get as far as Dilip Kabar, but it got as far as Dilip Kabar. Stories were leaked to the press. And finally, this must have been 63, Dilip Kumar went and saw Nehru, who he knew, because he'd done a lot for the freedom struggle and made movies on national integration. And Nehru was initially not very sympathetic, said, you know, it's a police spatter, but eventually intervened, which is how Dilip Kumar got away. But he would have been given a short trial, arrested, been asked to prove that he was not a Pakistani spy. On the basis of what? A name in a diary of a guy who, as far as I know, was never convicted of anything. But that's what it was like to be a Muslim in those days. And you're right, it hasn't changed that much. And, and we, is there a responsibility of the media to push back against this particular narrative? And it's in this last six it's decades... It's a responsibility of every citizen. Of everybody. Every yeah. citizen, no? But how do we do that? I mean, because this narrative has now got so strongly embedded into the psyche they're trying to shake it. What was one incident there today is an incident every second somewhere across the country. But you know, in a sense, enjoy all of us as liberals, we sort of, sort of set ourselves up because you believe and I believe that even if I don't agree with somebody, it's my job to give him a platform. It's our job to destroy him with our arguments and show that he's wrong. Which is, I mean, this is how I was brought up. This is what I believe in. I'm still against cancer, cancel culture. I believe everyone has the right to be heard. One of the great things about JLF is that people are, whose views I know that Sanjoy loathes will still be given an equal platform and will say things. And yet, what do you end up fighting about? You end up getting them on stage and you have to prove that Taj Mahal wasn't a Hindu palace. And it's by even having a debate on that, you're adding legitimacy to their cause. Yet, what's the alternative? You can't say, no, no, we won't discuss. And you say, ah, you're part of the great cover-up. So that is how much the dissent in our debate is now, that all the things we argue about are on the whole ridiculous and are distractions, which suits the government fine, no? 
I'm going to go fast forward because we're going to run out of time. And you then took your Bombay experience and your imprint uh -huh. experience to India Today, and which was a very formal time magazine kind of magazine. And you pitched to them the first film story. Yeah, my, that was actually when I was still at Bombay magazine. Uh, I see Arun is not in the audience, so I can tell the story. The way we used to edit India Today in those days was that we had many bound copies, well, or at least tied together copies of Newsweek and Time. And we used to go through all of them and look for story ideas. And I said to Arun, we should do a cover story that's a film story. And Arun had a rule. This is the time when all of India was stardust mad that he would not allow film gossip into the magazine because to his credit, he was benchmarking his publication against international publications, not against sort of the Illustrated Weekly or whatever. And we had the bound copies of Newsweek to prove it. And I finally said to him that you can do a film story that's not a gossipy story. And he said, it's not possible. So I went through the bound copies of Time magazine, and they'd done a story on a film called Barry Lyndon, made by Stanley Kubrick. And the cover was called Kubrick's, Kubrick's Grandest Gamble. And I said, we'll do a story like that about Satyam Shivam Sundaram. And after much persuasion, he finally agreed. So we did the first film story in India Today's history with a picture of a well, voluptuous Zinataman on the cover. And we called it with a remarkable lack of originality, Raj Kapoor's grandest gamble. But it worked. <laughs> we follow that thing. And since then, in Day Today has done what? It's at least three film stories every year. There's a wonderful story which I'm not going to dwell on, on Raj Kapoor's obsession with the bust, a bust. But yes. you can read that in the book. Um, and, and even that's been cleaned up a lot by my publishers. <laughs> <laughs> But we're going back to your, um, your love for food. I mean, yeah. in many ways, this started when you were in Oxford. You had an inheritance. You decided, shall I squirrel it away, yeah. or should I use it uh, to your best uh, intentions? Tell us about how that journey began and your work with okay. food. Well, my parents traveled a lot. There was a phase in my life, and my father, who died when I was 15, but before he died, he was doing very well. He had a flat in London, so I would spend, I was at boarding school, I'd spend my summer holidays in London, my winter holidays in Bombay. And from London, we'd go to America, we'd go to Scandinavia, we'd go to France, we'd really travel, which meant we stayed in hotels, and because he was a bit lavish and flamboyant, we'd stay in very expensive hotels and nice suites, eat at nice restaurants. So I developed quite early a sense of what the good life was like. I didn't actually understand it. Nobody does the age of 13 or 14. But at least it didn't intimidate me any longer because I'd seen it. And then he died, and I think we fell onto pretty hard financial t times. But there was enough money for me to go to Oxford. So I went to Oxford, and my first term, my Oxford Don called me, and he said, are you going to pay the overseas fee, which is what they made every person who wasn't British pay in those days, and it was double or triple the normal fee. And I said, yes. He said, no, no, you can't do that. And he found a reason to claim I was British because I was born in London. And then he said, you should apply for a grant. So I said, what is that? In those days, it seems very hard to believe. If you were Brit, not only was your entire college education paid for, but the local council of the borough you lived in would send you money to help you with your expenses, what was called a maintenance grant. So I said, well, I don't have a local council. I don't live here any longer. And he said, you must have a relative who lives here. So I had an aunt, a spinster aunt. And he said, apply to her, uh, her council. So I applied to her council. And to my absolute horror, they said, not only will we pay your fees, we will also give you a generous sum of money every term to spend. So all the money that had been saved up for my education I could now have put it away and planned for something after I finished college. Or I could blow it up. So I blew it up. Questions. I know we have five minutes. Any hey. questions? Anybody? Adit? Yeah, hi, Adit. Uh, by the way, Adit features in the book as well on yes, page uh, something. If or people the other. don't know the story, I had a column, which I still do, called Root Food. I had, a, I had two separate television careers. I was an interviewer on television and a moderator. I did shows like Question of Answer, Star Talk, which are basically one-on-one -on -one interviews. And I had a writing career where I wrote about food. 
And one day, Aditya came to see me. He was with Discovery then. And he said, why can't we turn root food into a television show? And I said, it's never really occurred to me. And nobody's ever done it in India. There was no food television, nothing. And he said, no, I think we can do it. And we did it. And he launched me on another career. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. I want to come back to what you were talking about, about the Taj Mahal, yeah. you know, containing Shiva statues and things. And yeah. there's, uh, let's say, a lot of us anti-bhakts who yeah. kind of justify or say that, you know, at some point we're going to reach a tipping point where everybody is going to realize that this is going from the sublime to the ridiculous. And suddenly people are going to, you know, change their political affiliations. Do you ever see that happening or do you think that we're going to get anywhere close to something like that? You know, I don't know. When I was at school, there was, I'm trying to remember the headline, the title of a book. There was a book by a man called P.N. Oak, who was president of the Society for Rewriting in, in Indian History, in brackets, or oh, why I hate Muslims, because it was all about stuff like this, where how terrible Muslims were and how everything that Muslims had done in India had actually been Hindu stuff that they'd stolen. And I, we used to read the book and we used to laugh because it was ridiculous. And then he wrote a whole book, this came out in the 60s, called Taj Mahal was a Hindu palace. And we laughed. And I remember I was on a school trip in 1970 or 71, and we went to the Taj Mahal and we saw it again. And we came out and there was a counter selling books. And the best selling book, which everybody was buying, was Taj Mahal was a Hindu palace. So the idea has been around for a long time. And you think the guy would be laughed out of town by now with all that ridiculous nonsense, but he has credibility. Subramaniam Swami filed a case for saying Taj Mahal was a Hindu palace. Now, as we've seen, it's become another big issue. So what happens, I think, is that when people are educated the way you and I say were, we laugh at these things. But when people are educated with textbooks that tell them about the horrors of Muslim rule and the victimhood of Hindus, etc., they are less willing to laugh, which is why I think the RSS is so keen on getting at the history. I do not dispute the claim that many historians were lefties and therefore maybe there was a Marxist tinge to our history. I don't dispute that. But certainly what's happening now, because it's just a single point agenda, directed just one community, is directed at creating a new generation, which unlike you and me, who will get fed up by all this and say, this has gone far enough, will say, hey, this is the truth, isn't it really? So I'm no longer very hopeful that people will say this has gone too far. Any other question? Hello, Veer. Hi. Is, um, food is the reason you became, I believe, a close friend with Ritu Dalmia. Yes, I did. Yes, <laughs> this is true. And the uh, second question is um, this conflict, what is happening and what we are discussing now. Is it really going to help India in the future? Because you know, our entire focus has been diverted and this 300 million Muslims uh, who is feeling uneasy in the country uh, is not going to simply take it for too long. Yeah, I think this is the problem with all the bhakt thinking. The problem is, I mean, their paradigm is the Mughal period when Hindus could go about doing whatever it was they were doing, but there was no doubt that they were not on par with Muslims. Some of them had to play jizya, had to pay a tax for being Hindus. They say that if Hindus could live like that, why can't Muslims now? I mean, it's a distorted view of the Mughal period anyway, but certainly that is what they want to implement. Now, there is a mismatch because their assumption is that when Hindus revolted in those days, they were put down by the army and we will do the same thing. But that was a different era. If you take the Sikh agitations of 1980 to 86, Sikhs constitute 2% of our population. When they wanted to secede, well, when a minority wanted to secede, when they felt they were being treated badly as Hindus, they created chaos all over India. Eventually, they killed our prime minister. So if you are going to not be able to cope with 2%, what happens when you keep treating, pushing 15% of your population into a situation where it feels it has no stake in India, it has no reason to continue subscribing to the ideology that this nation was once built on because that ideology no longer exists? I mean, for years and years, we've said that there were hardly ever any Indians in Al-Qaeda or in ISIS. 
because Indian Muslims were different. They didn't believe in all that fanaticism. But what are we doing? We are making them conscious that as far as we're concerned, they're Muslims first and Indians second. So if you push them into that direction, what's going to happen? So my fear ultimately is yes, what these guys are doing is disgraceful. But if they are not voted out, and if this continues, it's a mistake to think that a younger generation of Muslims is going to sit there and take this lying down. If you treat them so badly, they're going to feel they have nothing to lose any longer. And how will India manage? I mean, down that road lies civil war. Last question. Hi, Veer. <coughs> you, uh, you have such Hi. an... Hi. You have such an amazing global experience. I have a small question. Yeah. When the internet is breaking all the boundaries and the world is becoming small, yeah. on the other hand, the, all the political deglobalization which we are seeing, not just in India, you see whether it's US or Brexit or yeah. Russia, Ukraine, whatever is happening. So two quite oppo opposite things are happening and growing very fastly on the internet use is reaching everywhere and the deglobalization and the regional growth. So how you see this controversy will grow and how it will go to the common man? How the contradiction will grow. This yeah. is such a huge contradiction, what we see. Yeah. Anyone who is saying being a Gorukshak, I don't know what he's doing in the evening. So yeah. I've seen this and how, how the situation we will cope up in coming time. Not but India, but for the, the world. Yeah, world. Yeah. Yes, yes. Well, I think we've made a mistake with globalization which is that globalization is seen, I think, all over the world, which we are now coming to terms with, as something that benefited the elites. If you listen to Trump's rhetoric, the anti-Mexican stuff, the stuff about how America has been pushed away for too long, pushed around for too long, it appeals basically uh, to a white lower middle class who hate what they call an East Coast elite or they hate rich people. If you, listen, if you look at where the votes for Brexit, which is again an example of a revolt against globalization, came from. They tended to come from the north of England, from people who felt that they were losing out because the elite was gaining from all this European stuff. What's happening in India is a little bit more complicated because globalization in India has empowered more people than anything else. The average Gaurakshak or Bhat can go home, he can watch anything he wants on his phone, he now has access to international influ uh, information. He now has access to Netflix, Amazon, stuff like that. So in India, we're seeing a more complex situation. We are seeing an embrace of global technology, but a rejection in many ways of global ideology. When Mr. Modi was elected, his greatest claim was that he was respected all over the world and that he would make India a country that could be proud of itself again. If you listen to the rhetoric they now use, America is biased against us, we'll teach them a lesson, the West is resentful of our success. It's now changed. China, which is his great, uh, great pal, is now our enemy, which they are, because they occu illegally occupy hundreds of acres of Indian land. So the narrative has changed from one that was pro-globalization to one that is be suspicious of the rest of the world, but take what you can from them. And that's a very uneasy balance, and I'm not sure it can last. The last question is that uh, yeah. every prime minister or every editor has always been an advisor or uh, had access to every prime minister all the way to uh, before Modi. Yeah. Is that still uh, the sort of access point for most of the editors? And without that, how does the media have that kind of power that people like you used to say, for example. The media, media doesn't have any power, it doesn't have any access, and it doesn't have any influence, nor does it have any insights. Just think about this, your average cabinet reshuffle. In the old days, people would speculate so-and-so will be the next finance minister, so-and-so will be dropped. In all the years that Modi has been prime minister, not once have the media got it right. Almost everything that's happened has come as a surprise. We're going to elect a president soon. Nobody in the media has any idea who the contenders are. When Kovind became president, his name had not appeared on anybody's list of likely candidates to become president. 
Mr. Modi does not talk to the media. He doesn't even talk to many of his ministers. They also don't have an idea of what he's really thinking. There is a close circle of bureaucrats around him who probably have some insights. They will not talk to the media. So I think never before has the media been as ill-informed as it is today. Forget about editors or proprietors going and advising the prime minister. They're lucky if they're allowed in for five minutes. How do you see that changing, if at all? I and how will media change because of this? I think you'll have the kind of media we have now, the kind of media you have in America, where Biden goes to the White House press corps and they make fun of him, and etc. That kind of atmosphere, which is adversarial, because they still will attack him, and yet both sides accept that it's their job to be adversarial, that situation is dead in India. You have a situation now where Mr. Modi, partly because of his command of social media, feels he can communicate directly with the people. He feels he doesn't regard the media. I think in the beginning, he regarded the media as a necessary inconvenience. He now regards it as an unnecessary inconvenience. On that happy note, please do pick up uh, A Rude Life, which should also read The Good Life. It's an incredible story. It's available at the Tuk Tuk right there. Veer Sangvi, thank you so thank much you. for being here thank you. and for this uh, conversation. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank you so much thank for you. listening. Thank, thanks, Sanjay.